a me spetta l'onore di dire alcune parole. The title of the festival is uh, Identity and uh, Global Crisis. Uh, we will uh, uh, focus on the first of these topics, uh, that is identity, and we will speak about identity and personality, which are two very uh, similar um, uh, subjects. Uh, uh, identity is something that one chooses, and personality is the result of many factors. While there can be more identities, if you want, there can be different identities, depending on the problem uh, tackled. Uh, they can be father or son uh, in the same day. And personality is uh, unique. Of course, uh, there are cases of double personalities, uh, but uh, normally there is just one. So the uh, notion of personality and uh, uh, identity has uh, been uh, the topic uh, both of uh, economists' uh, research uh, works uh, and also psychology research works. And Professor Heckman uh, is uh, perhaps the person who has uh, most uh, focused on uh, psychology, neurology, biology, economics. Um, so it's been a very uh, broad-based uh, um, synergy and uh, cooperation. And it is the uh, scientists uh, themselves who look forward uh, the contribution of uh, Professor Ekman. And uh, all this is due to the rigor, uh, rigorous work of uh, James Heckman. This is something which has uh, always uh, characterized uh, his academic life. Uh, James uh, Heckman is anti-ideological. He was at the University of Chicago, where it is commonly known that there is uh, an approach uh, which is uh, against uh, public interventions. Uh, but uh, on more than one occasion, uh, Professor Heckman actually recognized uh, that markets need uh, regulation and that public interventions are necessary for some uh, cases. And then he is a very critical man, also self-critical man. I remember a famous declaration. Once he said, many things are made by the economists explain things that people already know. And the reason why he received the Nobel Prize is, above all, for his contribution in the area of micro data analysis trying to understand uh, that uh, some of these data uh, actually hide uh, uh, information, and so it's necessary to uh, remedy uh, these uh, uh, situations of uh, errors, uh, of uh, biases, uh, because there are samples uh, which do not give us uh, full information. Heckman's uh, work uh, has been a guidance uh, for all of us uh, he also focused uh, uh, on uh, uh, data, uh, saying that uh, uh, it is necessary to have also the theoretical work of economists, uh, and this work is only statisticians' work. And this is very important because uh, perhaps in the past, uh, uh, economic, economists uh, looked at data only as uh, pure statistics uh, without asking the right questions to data. Today, we will uh, focus on the distinction between uh, cognitive and non-cognitive uh, uh, abilities and the processes uh, which lead uh, to the formation of uh, abilities or capabilities. Now, cognitive capabilities are those uh, which are commonly tested, uh, for example, when you have a PISA test or many school tests, uh, school exams, uh, you test uh, the level of uh, cognitive uh, abilities. Uh, or um, IQ tests, uh, for example. Those are tests uh, which look at cognitive abilities. Uh, but then there are also non-cognitive capabilities. Uh, for example, perseverance, uh, um, uh, co 
consciousness uh, or uh, self-esteem, uh, well, these uh, uh, non-cognitive abilities uh, um, um, have been focused on by Professor Ekman and are major uh, capabilities uh, which affect uh, the behavior, the performance, and the success of the person. And they also uh, affect uh, the acquisition of cognitive capabilities. Well, but apart from his theories, uh, it is uh, his activity which uh, demonstrates that non-cognitive abilities are important. James Heckman is uh, an untireable person, a person who continues to have uh, uh, multiple interests, uh, and he has an agenda of research which is really unlimited. Um, when you invite him, and I'm very happy that he accepted our invitation, you feel a bit guilty because it's, you say, well, uh, we took uh, time away from him, uh, which uh, he would have used uh, to uh, go on uh, with his uh, uh, research projects. And uh, my uh, guilt is double because I'm taking away time from his uh, presentation, and so I give him the floor straight away. Uh, thank you very much, Dito, for that kind introduction. I'm not sure uh, I, I'm, you're going to, I'm losing that much uh, productivity, but we'll see. I'm very happy to be here at this conference, happy to be here with George Akerlof, and, and looking forward to his talk. And uh, the general theme of identity and identity in economics is, of course, something that George has done fundamental work on. And I view personality as being part of the aspect of understanding identity. and. I want to give some aspects of identity and, and psychology and psychology of personality that is uh, uh, maybe uh, not so familiar. So let me give a little overview about the relationship between economics and psychology. At one point, uh, economics and psychology were closely united. This was like 150 years ago. And I think anybody who knows the history of economic thought will know that a major development in economics in the first half of the last century was the weaning of economics from psychology. This was viewed as high level of progress. And it culminated in revealed preference analysis that replaced any concept of measurable utility, uh, any cardinal utility, as it's called, with ordinal concepts and minimalist assumptions. But I think what's happened in the last 60 years is a gradual reattachment of the two fields. And since the middle of the last century, economists, starting with von Neumann and Morgenstern, have returned to certain versions of cardinal utility, the measurable utility, to understand choices that people make in situations where there's risk. And we know, and uh, there's a strong group here in Trento, uh, in behavioral economics, that's extensively drawn on the psychology of preferences, the work of Kahneman and Tversky, notably, and others, and it's introduced a variety of new preference specifications into economics to explain behavior. Uh, behavior that's found not only in the field, out in natural settings, but also in laboratory. And this is a major development and an important development for our understanding of phenomena. And what we've learned from this subject has been new concepts of what we mean by risk aversion, how people perceive the future, time discounting, uh, notions of loss aversion and ambiguity aversion, and social preferences that actually explain a lot of behaviors that standard theory cannot explain. In that sense, it's a major scientific advance, and it's an advance that continues. There's also another line of work by economists, and I mentioned a Dutch economist of some 30 years ago, Bernard von Prague, who, working with psychologists, have started to measure happiness. And of course, there's a large body of work uh, done by Kahneman, Alan Kruger, uh, and uh, Richard Laird, and others that quantify a version of uh, Bentham's uh, social utility. So Bentham is associated with a concept of the greatest good for the greatest number, but he had a real sense, I think, that a utilitarian approach could be captured by some quantitative utility, and that, that approach is still used. But what I want to talk about today is a more recent development, and that's something that I think is new and exciting, and that is that economists have drawn on and contributed to an aspect of psychology that is what I call personality psychology. 
I will, I will define that in, in, uh, in, in right now. But I think that personality, which has an intuitive concept, uh, is one aspect of identity, and it fits well into the theme of this conference. So let me do a little background, because I want to place how personality psychology entered economics. It's a little different than the way other components of psychology entered. And I think there's an, there's an interaction between the psychologists and the economists in personality psychology that's a little more unusual than the traditional relationship. So let's go back and review the basic economic model of choice and, and to see how I see personality psychology contributing to this. So the standard model that many of you have probably seen or you've seen versions of or know or teach is a model that talks about preferences that people have over choices and then constraints that people face. So we always live in a world of constrained environments and we also have preferences. Some people prefer more, prefer more of this and less of that and are willing to trade off. And so this is a central idea, preferences, but then also constraints. The modern development in economics has broadened the concept of constraints to include things like information and expectations. So we've learned in a major development, and of course George uh, participated in this development uh, in, in revolutionizing economic theory, is systematically incorporating information and expectations into current information. And these also constitute constraints on the individual. Individuals who can't really fully know what goods they're buying, what world they're facing, these are important constraints. And I think that the motivation by economists, however, in personality psychology came more on the constraint side than on the, on the preference side. And that makes it a little different from behavioral psychology. So let me give you a brief history. So here I'm giving you a, an Econ 101 lesson, and I hope I'm not boring you or insulting you when I do so. But this is a standard diagram that all of us teach, and it's basically a diagram that says that individuals are constrained by resources. There are two goods, good X1, good X2, and we can only live within the area beneath that constraint. Uh, and we, we can't live outside our means. Uh, and that is a very fundamental notion in economics. Now we add to that notion of constraint preferences. And so preferences determine where we settle on the budget set. So the argument is, well, the higher levels of this curve, I call an indifference curve, a curve that says how we trade off one good for another in preferences, higher levels associated with better well-being and agents would seek to try to achieve a higher level of well-being. And that's the choice selected. So the choice selected is one that maximizes utility. That's so standard, it's just part of the central body of economics. And the standard exercise is, suppose we make good one much more expensive. And so what does that mean? It means that for the same resources that you have, you can buy less of good X1. So that's why the budget sets shrunk towards the origin. It means you now have fewer possibilities for buying good one. You can spend the same amount on good two, but not the same amount on good one. Then we say, okay, preferences in a normal fashion, we'll look at this and we'll see, yes, what do we select? We select this point here in the new regime. And the fundamental uh, proposition is, as the price of good one goes up, we buy more of, uh, uh, price of good one, we buy more. We substitute towards good two. That's the law of demand. That's a fundamental principle in economics. But I think we should go back and step back from this, and this helps motivate some of what I'm talking about, and I think motivates some of the discussion in the conference. Long ago, a colleague of mine, Gary Becker, uh, showed something that really shows the fundamental nature of constraints. And he showed that however irrational people are, they operate under constraints. And he also showed that many of the traditional implications of, of economic theory are consequences of constraints, in particular the law of demand. So here, let me go back to the same picture. This is the, our budget set. What Becker said is suppose that people were completely irrational. They're like molecules. They're like clouds of gas. The one thing that a cloud of gas, if just the gas in this room or the gas in this budget set has to respect is that it can't consume more than it has. It, it cannot, it has to live within its means. And so out of that proposition, he said, well, you may not be at the frontier, but you will have to live within your means. And so that, the idea of irrational behavior is that no matter what we say about preferences, we're still going to have 
people constrained. And the budget set affects a lot of our, our, a lot of our choice. So let's go back to our experiment where the price of good one has fallen. We ask, what happens in that situation? Well, if the price has fallen, we know that people can't attain the red dot anymore. They have a new budget set. And so rational or irrational, on average, if they distribute themselves, they're going to tend to move towards good too. And that's Becker's theory of irrational behavior. Now, I don't want to dwell on that theme except to say that constraints are a very natural way to approach the study of many economic problems. They're more easily measured in many cases. And economists have borrowed from psychology in another powerful way, in a way that's not so much the way behavioral economists have talked about, but in the way that uh, more labor economists and people borrowing from the IQ literature have thought about. And that is that IQ is a principal determinant of earnings. And earnings, the money that you have, is basically a major determinant of this constraint, how much money you have. So IQ is actually affecting choices in the sense of affecting your budget set. Recently, in work that actually started by some Marxist economists some 30 years ago, uh, uh, Sam Bowles and Herb Gentis in particular, studied personality as a determinant of earnings, as well as information and preferences and the like. And I want to talk today about this notion of personality as a set of constraints, like IQ, that affect the options that people choose. And in that sense, I, want, I like to think of this as, as somewhat complementary to the activities that go on in other parts of psychology and economics, but it focuses somewhat differently on this constraint side of the problem. So I, 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 I like the idea, and I think many economists like the idea of loading as much of our explanation into constraints as we can and less into preferences because it avoids the temptation, which most economists resist, of saying, well, you know, if I have a new situation, something has changed, the preference has changed, that can be a very troubling and, and too easy strategy. Here, if we simply isolate the way that changes have occurred because of budgets, we can sometimes have a less tautological explanation. So I want to talk about this body of work because it, it forms the way we think about uh, under, uh, human development. And, but I also want to consider the origin of preferences, so I don't want to just focus only on constraints, personality and cognition, and how families and other social institutions affect these things. This, I think, is a very powerful tool for understanding the origins of inequality and in helping to devise policies to reduce it. And it helps us to take us away from some of the foci of focus of a lot of public policy discussions. Let me give you an example of the power of personality traits that are frequently neglected in public policy discussion. In the United States, we have a program. It's called the GD program. The name's not so important, but it's a program given to people who are secondary school dropouts. Secondary school dropouts who don't complete the ordinary curriculum in a school can take a test and certify that they are the equals in the test of people who ordinarily complete secondary school. So this is a way for a dropout to be made whole. And in the United States, this program now accounts for close to 14% of all secondary school degrees that are presented. And it's growing, and so it's a huge program. It's been growing until recently. What this is, is a test of cognitive abilities. It's not much different from the PISA scores. And the scores, the IQ tests are a little different, but the achievement tests, sometimes called Iowa tests or PISA scores, are very similar to what the GED says. Let me show you that this test is actually very successful in the way that typical public policy measures things. Here's a study from work that I did with Yona Rubinstein and Jing Jing Si some seven or eight years ago now, where what we did is we looked at the density of age-adjusted armed forces qualifying. Think of these as PISA scores. These are achievement test scores that are used daily to decide whether schools are succeeding or failing, who is succeeding, who is failing. So we have a distribution on the left for white males and the, and the right for white females. The male-female difference isn't the issue here. We're, these, are ordinary, these are the scores of ordinary secondary school graduates. Where do the GEDs fit in this distribution? These are the people who couldn't finish school, but nonetheless took the test. Where do they fit? Almost perfectly. A little bit below, but almost perfectly. They have the same test scores as people who are 
uh, ordinary high school, secondary school graduates. And that looks very good. And by the standards that we currently use to measure and decide policy, what this is is that these people have been made whole. We've actually certified a group of people who are just as good as ordinary secondary school graduates. Yet, actually, they earn at the rate of dropouts. So even though they actually have the same test scores, they're actually earning at the rate of dropouts. Something is missing in our current thinking. And I argue that they're as smart as ordinary high school graduates, but they lack non-cognitive skills. And that's the theme that I want to develop. And in fact, you can look at these GEDs, and in fact, these are the wise guys who can't finish anything. I'm writing a, a small book on this, actually. It's fascinating be simply because in so many areas of life, they drop out of marriage, they drop out of the army, uh, they drop out of almost anything they start. They start jobs, but they drop out much more rapidly. So there's a trait missing that the test score doesn't capture. So what I want to argue is that these is just one of many examples that I could give, and I'll talk a little bit about these examples. But what I want to argue is that incorporating personality enriches economics, that a core low-dimensional set of capabilities explains a lot of socioeconomic outcomes. And cognitive and non-cognitive abilities can be measured. They can both be measured. Sometimes non-cognitive abilities are called soft skills. The argument is we can't measure them well. But that's simply false. We have developed measurement systems and we have a lot of indicators that give us as hard a piece of evidence on their causal effects as for non-cognitive skills. And so I want to show you a little bit of that evidence today. And the other part that's very important is not only do they determine many outcomes, so when we think about what determines success and failure in life, incentives matter for sure. Cognitive and non-cognitive capabilities, personality as well as smarts, both matter. But we also know that their origins are not strictly genetic. It's not a question of who you're born to. It's not a question of your father's genes or your mother's genes. It's really a question also of social environments. And that's the exciting part of this work. And what we've also learned is that there are sensitive periods for the development of these skills. And at many of the gaps between the rich and the poor, the haves and the haves nots, start at very early ages, long before people enter school. But it's not purely genetic. And we've also found that these sensitive periods for development are earlier in life for cognitive capabilities and later for non-cognitive capabilities. And that's important, too, for the way we think about social policy, exploiting this new information. So what I would argue, too, is that this has substantial interest for the fact that we should treat people not as identical. I think that's a bias that many economists have, a traditional representative agent model. And then what we've learned from a large different collection of bodies of work in psychology and economics is the heterogeneity that's manifest. And we need to think more broadly. So let me just to go very briefly over some of these abilities and show you what the evidence is. So we need to understand the multiplicity and power of capabilities. So the one thing we've learned, and this is something that has come from a large body of empirical research with long, large longitudinal data sets with very detailed information, that ability matters and abilities are multiple in nature. Now, what do I mean by uh, cognitive abilities? Well, psychologists will frequently distinguish two different ideas of cognition. One is the notion of uh, crystallized intelligence, which is kind of knowledge, how well we can command a body of recognition, a, a set of techniques that we've learned, a set of reactions to sort of common problems. And then fluid intelligence, the ability to solve a problem de novo. And we know that there are different age profiles for their development. And in fact, uh, unfortunately for most of the people in the room, fluid intelligence peaks out around 19, 20, <laughs> and then it's downhill. Uh, and uh, uh, crystallized intelligence allegedly keeps growing. So there's wisdom with age. At least I hope so. So cognitive abilities we know, and they've been studied. And there's a large body of work. We've had IQ tests and achievement tests around for more than 100 years. Less well-developed and still somewhat of a hodgepodge is this concept of non-cognitive capabilities. They involve traits that are sometimes thought of like perseverance, our avoidance of risk, our desire for leisure, our motivation to achieve certain things, our self-esteem, how hard we work on problems, 
what is our what is our the relationship that we have for the future? How much do we discount the future? And what way do we discount the future? And self-control, aspects of self-control, which behavioral economists have looked at uh, quite, uh, quite extensively, and, and the notion of forward-looking behavior. The one thing that I would urge that we recognize, and this is a very important body of work in, in personality psychology, is there's a vi view out there that some people have argued, some economists, that these traits, especially the psychological, the personality traits, are very situational specific, that they re people respond specifically to the situation that they're in. And what I want to argue is they aren't solely situational specific. Situations affect the manifestation of these incentives, but they do not shape entirely what these traits are. These traits evolve over time. They're affected by the environment. But over time, there's persistence in levels of these traits, especially when we standardize measurement situations. And the key thing is that these traits are causally affected by family and social environments. And so what we've learned is that both types of capabilities have direct causal effects on a wide range of behavior. So there's nothing inimical to economic theory. In fact, economic theory has always said that a low dimensional set of traits, preference traits, may be enriched by the new personality and psychology traits that have been introduced recently, can explain a wide range of behavior. And I just point to these, wages, schooling, crime. Let me just show you some examples. This is an example taken from some work in, in psychology. I don't know if people can see this uh, figure. I know you have a handout, so maybe you can look at that. But this shows uh, for different traits, leadership, job performance, longevity, college grad grades, and years of education, the importance, just in a simple sense of correlation between IQ, which is what we mostly focus on, and success. So for example, if you look at leadership, you'll see that IQ has actually got a lower correlation with success and leadership than conscientiousness, another psychological trait. And the bunch of these psychological traits is much more predictive. We get uh, that IQ is somewhat better in job performance, but not so much different uh, than conscientiousness. If we look at something like college grades, well, IQ matters, of course, but so does conscientiousness and years of education. And just to show some examples from some work of, by economists, if we ask the question, well, what's the probability of somebody ever having landed in jail at age 30 by measurements of these traits taken at much earlier times? If we go down the distribution, it's been very commonly uh, noticed by many uh, psychologists and economists that less capable people, people with lower cognitive skills, are much more likely to commit crime. And you can see that when you go from the bottom of the distribution, which is the left side of the figure, to the right side of the distribution, you'll see the probability of being in jail goes down. Cognitive skills are important. Non-cognitive skills are also important. And these are causal effects. I can't get into the details of that, but this is it. And so what we find is that both cognitive and non-cognitive skills are important. I'm going to come back to this figure. Look at teenage pregnancy, yet another problem, which is usually associated with disadvantage for the children, the next generation, and for the mother. Cognitive skill, huge difference. 10% chance of being single with a child and a teenage child pregnancy. Uh, very high if you have low cognitive ability, very low with high cognitive ability. If you look at non-cognitive ability, you find it actually almost the same trade-off. So they're equally predictive. And I could produce hundreds of these graphs. In fact, I did have hundreds in Tito edit them out, so I'll, I'll stop. But I will say that something that economists worry a lot about, wages. Again, if we look at the gradient, the response, of what happens as we move from the bottom to the top, increasing wages, we see equally powerful effects of cognitive and non-cognitive skill in the sense of moving from the bottom to the top. So what do we know? This is a very exciting uh, findings. We have a lot of predictive evidence, and this shows that these traits matter. We also know that there are two parallel system of preference parameters that have been developed in psychology and economics. And the research in this area is very active, putting these together. So right now, I think it's fair to say that economic preference parameters like time preference, risk aversion, inequality aversion, altruism, uh, reciprocity, these traits we know are important. They do predict. There's no question about it. But they can also be related to these psychological traits. And so what you're seeing is not only a theoretical exercise of putting two bodies of work together, but you're uniting in one place a tremendous body of findings from two literatures, 
which will reinforce each other. And we can write, but we still are in the process of synthesizing these literatures. Now, a third finding from this literature, and this is very important, this has a huge implication, is that when we measure these traits in stable measurement systems over the age of people, and we follow people over time, I'll just give you one example, that gaps and differences between people in these traits open up very early in the lifetime. So let me give you an example. This is a program that I'm studying with a developmental psychologist and, and several others, uh, including Greg Duncan, uh, an economist at uh, Irvine. And what we're finding is the following. Test scores play a very powerful role in explaining who goes to college and who doesn't. We know that. And in the U.S., when we looked at this, we find that once you control for the test score, the family income or the tuition at a college plays almost no role in explaining who goes to college, who doesn't. The test score is extraordinarily important. But gaps in these test scores open up long before schooling begins. So let me show you this. This shows you the test score gap starting at three, which is about as early as time as we can measure it, up to age 18. And this is now classified by the measure of advantage, in this case the mother's education. And what you find, these people were randomized into these, uh, there's a lot of detail here, but the important thing is the gaps between people at age 18, which are on the right side of this graph, are about the same as the gaps that are there at three and certainly by age five. So what this means then is that we can't in any fundamental way account and say that schooling or things that are going on in schools are explaining the gap. What we found is that schooling after the first few years plays only a very minor role in creating or reducing the gaps. And we get a similar story for non-cognitive skills. So we, I think it's very important that reorients. These, th these factors are important and gaps between the haves and the have-nots are opening up very early in the lives of children long before they enter school. Now, this kind of information that gaps open up and when you control for these factors in a statistical sense, they can eliminate them, leaves open a very basic question. It doesn't rule out a genetic explanation. You could say, okay, it is the manifestation of genes, and some people would say that. Some people would say, no, no, it has to do with family environments or family investments more generally. And what I want to show you is some brief evidence from intervention studies that suggest an important role for investments in family environments in determining these capabilities. So it suggests, yes, genes play a role. What we've also learned is there's a powerful gene-environment interaction, and we've also learned that we can supplement families and reduce some of these gaps, in some cases substantially so. And let me just make an observation that with the data that we've uncovered, we can study how families differ. And families vary a great deal in the amount of investments they make in children. Disadvantaged families spend substantially less time with their children, give the child substantially less advantage. Uh, in the last 20 years, as knowledge of child development has expanded, more educated women, while they're working more, have actually been spending more time in child development, precisely because they recognize the value. Less educated women also working more, although the growth is a little less, but also not spending any time more. So a gap is opening up in the resources available to young children. And so what I would argue is that there's a divide is opening up between the advantaged and the disadvantaged in many countries around the world certainly in the U.S., and that those who are born into disadvantaged environments are receiving relatively less stimulation, which we know to be important, and it leads to a major source of inequality. Now, what have we learned? We've learned that critical, there are critical and sensitive periods, more sensitive periods than critical periods, but a large body of work in epidemiology and neuroscience has actually documented that there are sensitive periods where certain investments and certain activities have a huge payoff for lifetime outcomes. And if those activities are not made, then there's substantial disadvantage that accrues. Some of the most dramatic would be biological insults. If a child is born with substantial vitamin A deficiency in the environment, that person may have blindness permanently without any known remedy. A small drop of vitamin A can eliminate that. Less dramatically, their language and other, other traits. So we know that, this is, uh, that the, there are critical and sensitive periods. But we also know, and this is the positive part of all this, that enriching early environments can compensate for the risks from disadvantaged environments. But what have we learned? And this is another key lesson. And this is why it's so important. If I, if I leave you with one lesson, I hope I leave you with several, but I want to leave you with one. 
and that is the power of these non-cognitive social emotional traits which are sometimes called soft traits. A main channel in which many interventions operate is through enhanced non-cognitive capabilities. Let me just give you one example. The United States has been very active in promoting uh, early childhood development. There's a famous experiment run some more 40 years ago, the Perry Preschool Program. These were kids who all of whom were disadvantaged, all of them African Americans, all of them were chosen to have subnormal IQs. And they were given initially separated into two groups. Some of them were randomly assigned in rich parenting environments. Others were inside just the ordinary environments. In rich parenting simply meant the parents got a little, stimu a little help on how to parent. The children were enrolled in programs, given opportunities they normally didn't get. These p children were randomized into two groups and they've been followed ever since. They're close to 50 years of age. In fact, I'm participating in a study to actually look at these people at age 50. They're, they're turning 50 as we, as we speak. So the people are followed 40 years and the interesting thing that came out of this program and true of many of these programs is that there was no effect on IQ. None. The way that we normally value social policy said this program was a failure. There's another program in the United States called Head Start and that program also was viewed as a failure. It was viewed as a failure. Why? Because it didn't boost the IQ. Yet, what happened is when we look at this program, I recently recomputed the rate of return and what we find is a strong, statistically significant rate of return of about 10% per annum for both boys and girls. A huge rate of return. Even if you take a normal equity market, if you look at the uh, stock market returns, it's about 5.8% uh, or up until uh, recently anyway. So what we've learned is that in fact there is a way to improve, but it's through social emotional skills, far more than through IQ. And that's something that current policy doesn't really embody. So the whole mentality of the PISA scores, the whole mentality of the IQ and the wealth of nations, I think ignores that. So let me talk about these traits. Since many people think that these traits are stable traits, let me show you a few pieces of evidence on this. These traits are not set in stone. They can be affected by investment. Perry is just one of many experimental studies with long-term follow-up. And these traits also are not just a matter of determined solely by the situation in which you find yourself. This is the graph that I was telling you about that uh, if you look in the graph that's sloping up, uh, crystallized intelligence is increasing, fluid intelligence is decreasing over your lifetime, and, uh, uh, but IQ, which is a quantified, uh, some composite of the two, is roughly stable. You can also look at how conscientiousness changes over the lifetime. And not surprisingly, people become somewhat more conscientious as they get older. Many of the other traits do evolve over time. And these are longitudinal studies on these traits. So what I would argue then is that what we have in, in current thinking today is that later, that, that what, what, what we've come to understand is that cognitive and non-cognitive traits matter. They're very predictive of a, lar a large variety of behaviors. But we undervalue the role of personality not only in producing these behaviors and in our capacity to influence and in shape to motivate people and to create uh, ambition and to create a sense of larger social engagement. What I would also argue that if we think about other kinds of public policy like for example uh, active labor market programs which aren't so prominent here in Italy but are in OECD Europe, uh, if we think of classroom size reductions and a lot of the traditional policies that we think about in terms of education and boosting the workforce skills what we find is that these programs are much less effective in terms of rate of return. I'll give you an example. Many people look at reduced classroom size. There's a famous paper by Alan Kruger and uh, David Card and Alan Kruger that shows the effects of reducing classroom size on raising adult earnings and that certainly a major channel is through improving schooling. But what they did do and what was done later was actually do a cost-benefit analysis of their study. You say, okay, I'm going to reduce classroom size. I am going to raise earnings, but it's going to cost money to hire teachers and it may even bid up uh, uh, the cost of the teacher salaries. That's a larger effect. When you do that, you actually find that the rate of return to reducing classroom size is either zero or negative. Very small. And when you go through a whole range of programs that are traditional in productivity enhancing programs like adult literacy programs, public job training programs, tuition reduction policy, rates of return on these are really quite low. So a general pattern has emerged that when we start 
trying to solve problems of social inequality, especially in the adolescent years, especially targeting cognitive skills, the returns on these programs are very low uh, and uh, they tend to be higher for both cognitive and non-cognitive individuals with higher levels of cognitive and non-cognitive traits. And the sad fact is that there are lower returns for the less able people, which is something people don't like to admit. However, I would say as a caveat, motivational programs that operate on social skills have some real effects in adolescent years. So a major finding from this literature is that there are substantial equity efficiency trade-offs for the less able when we start remediating later in life. So even when we think about going to the schools or into the secondary schools, what we do is we are actually starting way too late. But we also know that there is no equity efficiency trade-off, at least in the sense of saying targeting the disadvantaged, the less able, disadvantaged, those who are coming from disadvantaged situations early in life leads to high level of economic efficiency and helps reduce social inequality. I don't know if I should get into this, but I will. I'll try. So let me try to formalize this. I'm an economist, so I should put a few equations down, right? There's, a, there's, a, there's an occupational hazard, uh, but um, I, I will try to avoid uh, too many equations. But let me just think about this vector theta. The theta here is a standing for a bundle of capabilities. And I really mean capabilities in the sense of a Marchesin and, and Martha Nussbaum. I think of these as, as things that enhance the freedom of individuals, that enhance the potential of people. And you can add health, although that's another trait that I'm really not talking much about today, cognitive, non-cognitive trait. And when we think of outcomes, would we have to understand that the outcomes, which I call YKT, are produced not only by these capabilities, but by the effort that people exert in the situation to manifest the trait. So what we have to understand, and this is very important in sort of organizing the psychological evidence, interpreting the evidence, is that its situations have to be standardized when we make comparisons. If we're going to look at traits, if we're going to look at the manifestation of traits, we literally have to understand that we have to standardize for what the rewards are to manifest the trait. So a person who is punished heavily for being very aggressive may be very meek in one situation, but the situation may call in other cases for a very aggressive behavior. So we know that. So the, a lot of the discussion in personality psychology recently has been precisely to standardize environments so we understand that these traits actually are more stable, but we have to adjust for the environments. But the main thing that I want to take out of this is that, and this is very important for social policy, is there are many ways to achieve performance on a given task. Cognitive and personality traits both determine earnings. I showed you that a minute ago. And you can compensate for one shortfall by having greater strength than the other. And we also know from basic rule of comparative advantage, a concept borrowed from trade theory but applied to labor economics, that different tasks require different capabilities and that people pursue their comparative advantage by sorting into different tasks. And this equation essentially suggests that. Equation one is a model which is allowing for the fact that we can compensate in different dimensions, that we can incentivize people to perform, and that these different tasks, these different capabilities are all producing excellence and performance in different dimensions. And so we have to adjust for these in making comparisons across these tasks. But the, but the mythology that's been out there that these psychological traits are only situational specific is, I think, a, a complete myth. And I think we have to really understand that there are some stabilities in traits once we standardize for incentives. What do we know about the capability formation process? I won't give you many more equations, but I'll give you one more. What we've learned is that there are stages of development in the life cycle of a child. And in, in using a term which I've developed with Flavio Cunha, a, a graduate student of mine who's now at the University of Pennsylvania, he and I have developed what we call a technology of capability formation, and that's equation two. And what it says is that capabilities are produced partly by your capabilities last period, investments, and social and parental environments that are in this, in this environment. And so the structure of the... Uh, uh, so what we've learned then is that, and we've estimated these technologies that show the power of investments, the power of, uh, of, of self-productivity, and the power then of these traits. And a crucial notion in this literature is the complementarity. And that is that higher levels of, of a stock of theta, the more your level of the capability, the higher the productivity of investment at any point in time. And what we've also learned is 
that is you increase the stock of investment. So as investment goes up, you increase the stock of skills, but when you have a higher base to start with, you learn more. So what this means then is that the getting, the, getting it right early on in life plays a huge role because you can remediate in early on in life when people are fluid and when there's a lot of malleability and when you're building the base for later investment. But later in life, so there's a synergy that's going on. And this synergy explains a lot of the behavior. It explains why early nurturing environments affect the ability of animals and humans to learn. So we go back to this technology. Theta has multiple aspects. And what we've learned is motivating the kids, like the Perry kids, making them more interested in schooling actually motivates their achievement in schools. They're more likely to finish grades. Even though they may not be any smarter, they're more motivated. And it turns out they have a much higher level of achievement in many other skills. And this explains why investment in disadvantaged young children is so productive because they enhance the productivity of later investments. It also explains the dismal evidence about later active job market programs, programs that target disadvantaged people but much later in the life cycle. So let me just conclude. I really, really will bring this to a conclusion, but I wanted to summarize. I have a large body of empirical work and I just want to show you one or two policy simulations with this. What we found, and this is work that Flavio and I have and some work with Suzanne Shinnock as well, is what we find is they're relatively more productive for investment in, in cognitive skills early in life and relatively more uh, productivity for socio-emotional skills in later adolescent years. And that's partly associated with the development of personality. As we're human beings, we develop much richer traits. And as these personality traits emerge, the opportunity for working and assessing those traits and enhancing those traits as they emerge is enormous. So let me just focus on a, on a childhood that consists basically of an adolescent period and an early childhood period. That's it, just two periods for simplicity. And let me suppose that I'm a social planner. I'm just trying to maximize the amount of schooling. This is the kind of result that you get out of our study. So you look at all the conditions of disadvantage in American society and you ask what should be the optimal policy? I don't know if you can see this figure here. This figure on the left is a figure that gives you a measure of child disadvantage. So as you go back in the figure, you get more and more disadvantage. So one means high level of advantage, minus one means low level of advantage, okay? And the same is true of child initial cognitive capability. So these are the endowments the child is born with. The light figure suggests what a social planner, somebody who is only interested in maximizing the total schooling would do in terms of investment in, in, in children. And you can see in the thrust of this diagram on the left is that the investments are actually greater for the most disadvantaged. Even though there may be some complementarity, the huge productivity that comes from remediating downstream problems is, is investment in the, in, the, in the early years. So the, the black bottom lines are showing less investment, the top lines uh, more investment. If you go to the second period, it's reversed. That's where the equity efficiency trade-off occurs. You're actually finding more investments for those who started off earlier on. So if you wait too late, then you really do have a trade-off where you have to be, an economist has to have this kind of dismal science quality that you can't argue, well, I want to help poor people, but doing so runs against the economic efficiency arguments. Early on in life, the investments will actually both reduce inequality and e produce economic productivity, in this case, in enhancing schooling. So. Uh, let, me, let me skip past that and, and make one other point, and that is the following. What we've also learned, and this is something that's very important, depending on the outcome that we study, cognitive and non-cognitive traits are differentially affected. That was my outcome equation, remember? I had cognitive traits and I had non-cognitive traits. So cognition turns out to be relatively more important in explaining who graduates school than non-cognitive traits. Non-cognitive traits are important. But non-cognitive traits are most important. I saw that figure that I put up earlier. Crime is actually weighted much more heavily on non-cognitive traits. And so if you look at what a distribution of optimal ratios of early to late investment would be, if our target is to reduce crime, it might be to actually target more towards the later years. Oops. If, our, if, our, if our goal is to reduce, is to promote education, it might be to reduce relatively more in the early years. And the reason why there's a distribution here is that an optimal policy would recognize 
the different conditions of advantage and disadvantage that people have, the different conditions of parental background, the different initial endowments. And I'm sweeping all that down in these figures. But that's why we have a distribution here. So the bias is relatively early if we're trying to maximize education, relatively late investment, more late, not, not zero one, not all late, all early, but relatively more in the later years if our goal is to reduce crime. And that's just a consequence of the fact that non-cognitive traits flourish more in the later years and optimal policy can actually target that in the adolescent years more than the early years. <clears throat> so the timing depends on the condition we're trying to maximize, what we're trying to say. So let me just summarize. First of all, what I've tried to do, and maybe tried to do too much, but I, nonetheless I've done it, so I'll, 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 I'll conclude. That cognitive and non-cognitive capabilities produce a variety of behaviors. And I really want to stress that these personality factors, which are considered soft and fuzzy, are not. And this integration of personality psychology and economics really does enrich our thinking of policy. There's an emerging field of psychological measurements of personality and cognition, which is linking together traditional economic preference parameters with the psychological preference parameters. And I believe, just as we've enriched the normal set of behavioral parameters in, in standard economics, like the social preference parameters, we're going to have a deeper understanding of self-control, a deeper understanding of aspects of time preference by drawing on the psychological literature. We also know, and this is something that's extremely important, is that comparative advantage is an empirically important feature of economic and social life. People specialize, and we can trade off. We all know the people who are very smart but can't wake up in time. Those are the GEDs. They just can't put it together. And there are also people who are tremendously well organized who aren't that bright but nonetheless succeed. So we have to understand that there's a lot of comparative advantage out there in the world and there are traits and, and activities where people can use these traits. And that's an important and neglected dimension of social policy. Recent work on the technology of capability formation provides an operational empirical framework. Capabilities are not something that's just genetically determined. They are causally affected by parental investments. And they're not something that is just situational specific, although I think at one point in the behavioral economics literature, the view was that personality was an ephemera that was totally situational specific. That's just not true. What we need to do, and when you understand that, however, we have to standardize the measurements that we take. And what this technology of capability formation shows is it rationalizes a large body of evidence in economics, psychology, and neuroscience that these capabilities are self-productive, Health actually is a major determinant of education, cognition, and also uh, cognition and socio-emotional traits affect health. These synergies explain in a very important way why it's productive to invest in the cognitive skills of disadvantaged young children, but why later remediations for cognitive skills may not be very effective. There's no equity efficiency trade-off for, for investment in young disadvantaged children, but there is in older disadvantaged children. So I would conclude that, I, I mean, I, I hope I've had some uh, influence on your thinking about this. I think it's an exciting area of work where personality psychology, in addition to the ordinary cognitive psychology that's influenced so much of the thinking in behavioral economics, as well as the work on happiness and the work on risk aversion, will come together and help us with a richer economics and, and, a, and, a, and a social policy that's guided by fact and by, by a greater understanding of the... Uh, the, the, of what, what is possible for human beings. So thank you very much. It is indeed true that uh, while uh, Jim was preparing his slide, I, I suggested that he should cut down a bit because I was worried about the time. But uh, it was not taking into account the speed by which he... He was able, and the clarity, but I think he established a new record of a festival. Ah. I counted about 15 seconds per slide, but always very clear, very clear and very well structured. So it's now we have also time to, uh, uh, to take uh, uh, two questions. Um, I move to Italian, just to... Uh, uh, credo che tutti voi abbiate afferrato la, la, davvero la grandissima rilevanza pratica delle cose che ci ha spiegato oggi. Uh, pensate per esempio... 
think of the uh, effects of efficiency and equity, uh, think of um, cognitive capabilities, uh, think of the role uh, of families, uh, and the bad news uh, is that uh, disadvantaged families uh, uh, transmit less uh, of these uh, uh, capabilities. But then there is also good news, uh, for example, the Perry Preschool uh, Program, uh, and this is an encouraging uh, message in order to reduce the gap uh, which is created very early in life. And then a second uh, major thing, uh, um, an important application of what has been said uh, is the following. Much is said about the meritocracy. Well, here we have a fundamental dimension that is uh, non-cognitive abilities, which are often ignored uh, by tests and by uh, measurements. This is just to give you a couple of uh, uh, points. Well, we put the slides on the uh, website of the uh, festival. If you want, you can download them because the, uh, they are very, very interesting. There are many implications which uh, perhaps have been lost because of the speed. Uh, we have a couple of questions only because we don't have much time. The microphone. Uh, venga qui allora, venga qui, venga qui, se no altrimenti... Per me non c'è mai mai che sono i due. Sì, buongiorno. buongiorno. Hello, my name is Maurizio Sauro. I am a social scientist. I'd like to know what are the criteria for selecting children uh, where to intervene, because the uh, criterion, uh, the selection is fundamental, otherwise you uh, risk uh, uh, choosing uh, or selecting a child who is not ready for that specific investment. So what are the criteria for selection? Uh, the criteria of the child. There are a lot of child inventories that have been developed for looking at children who are at risk, but it's a combination of risk factor that it concerns the child's abilities, the child's cognitive and social emotional skills, but also the parenting environment. So the parental environment, it, that's, those are the so-called risk factors. So what we've come to understand, and you can, there are lots of, lots of pieces of information, but where the family structures are very weak, what you see is that less of what is normally done to middle class children is done to those uh, children. So you'll find fewer amounts of encouragement, less help with homework, less taking children out, going to the zoo, reading to the child. Um, and so the measure of inventory is a measure of disadvantage both in terms of, of parenting, and it's more, it's more parenting than it is money per se, and also in terms of the structure of uh, of the, own, of the child's own abilities and sort of shortfalls. So uh, the, the question should really be uh, more comprehensive that these are supplements to the family. It's not a targeted program only for the child. It's something that supplements the family and it supplements the resources of the family. And sometimes in the case of Perry and many of these programs is a supplement that's teaching parenting that's actually supplementing. So for example, a very effective program that the, uh, President Obama has endorsed, and I think there's some evidence supporting it, is a program where nurses go to young girls, all of whom are pregnant, uh, and uh, mostly teenage, uh, and uh, mostly unwed, and explains to them the disadvantage that comes from smoking and drinking when you carry a child. And this program, when uh, embraced, when evaluated, and people are followed 20 years later, leads to very large improvements in the well-being of the child. Well, all that is is basically telling the mother some common sense facts that most middle class women would know and would adopt and act on. And so in that sense, it kind of equalizes the advantage. So these programs have a very rich variety, but they're supplementing parenting as well as working directly with the children. So the measures of disadvantage now are pretty well documented. You can get inventories of families and, and so forth. C'è una domanda là in fondo? Ah vabbè, d'accordo, allora facciamo queste, poi quella in fondo e poi davvero chiudiamo. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Ok. Can you hear me? Ok. In the case
case uh, of uh, a new school uh, which we could uh, invent, uh, so what type of school could we invent uh, in order to uh, have the results uh, that you mentioned? Well, I don't think it's a school so much as kind of an approach to way child develop, the child would develop. I think it represents a, a, a way, you can think of it more as a family supplement. I wouldn't view it as a school. Remember, some of these gaps are showing up long before schools begin. So these are supplements to families, and these are really representing maybe, you can think of it as partly a school, you can think of it partly as a daycare center. But all you're doing, and you have to work with the family. I mean, the one thing we've learned in, in the last 100 years, 150 years of failed experiments, is that the family is the paramount factor in the life of the child. That's, that's an obvious point. But when we remove the parent, and there have been times in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, where indigenous children are removed from their parents that have had catastrophic consequences. So we have to supplement the life of the child. We supplement the life of the child in the family, and you work with the family. But I wouldn't call it a school, because it's not the formal division. In fact, I think the mistake that's been made, at least in the United States, and I think also increasingly in Italy, is the presumption that somehow schools are the source of skills in the society, and they're not. As I showed you before, those gaps in, in, in test scores, which we, which we feature, schools aren't adding that much. A very famous sociologist named James Coleman, who was my colleague, and we taught courses together at Chicago for years, he had a very important finding, which was most of the gaps between the haves and the haves nots in test scores came not from the school quality so much as the parental quality, the family homes. So what it does is it basically suggests that we refocus policy towards the family. Sometimes people don't like to think about that. But every family is under great stress. In the United States, we have close to 26%, 27% of all kids grow up in single parent homes. About 15% are in homes where the children have never seen the father. Father's never been a factor. And we know that that is associated with lower levels of wealth, lower levels of resources, lower levels of parental time. I'm not castigating the mother. I think the, the, the concerns are real. But the resources given to those, child, those children is lower. So recognizing the way the family is evolving, we need to devise policies that recognize and supplement families. So I wouldn't think of it as a school. I would think of it as a family supplement, something that works with the family and does not intrude on the family either. You don't want a situation of telling people what to do. You want to say, here, we want to supplement the life of the child. We want to think of, of an institution that goes beyond and, 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 and includes and, and builds a stronger family. Maybe you can think of it that way. Supplementing the resources of single parent families. And I know that in Italy, I was recently in Reggio and uh, we were looking at uh, the uh, famous program there. And what was very interesting to me it was that, that the Italian uh, thinking about this was very similar to the American thinking 30 or 40 years ago. Namely, the assumption was that all children came from healthy, functioning families. And yet many of the immigrant families in Reggio simply did not have the traditional Italian family structure. They did not have two-parent families. They did not have the same kind of access to Italian and to the basic language. So that they were growing up with a tremendous level of disadvantage. And when they entered the famed Reggio schools, they were at a huge disadvantage. And so I think we just have to realize that all societies are seeing increasing number of children facing this, this important aspect of disadvantage. So it's, it's a family supplement, not just a school. Grazie. L'ultima domanda, davvero. Purtroppo non possiamo andare oltre. Buonasera. Sono di... I am an expert in uh, uh, crime uh, at the university in Trento. We are working with Professor Tremblay, Richard Tremblay, whom you certainly know, who applies uh, his theories uh, to crime prevention. And uh, for some months, we have implemented uh, an early prevention scheme here in Trentino. It was not easy to start that project uh, for a various reasons. Often, when these uh, theories uh, are communicated, uh, um, they are interpreted in a sort of uh, deterministic uh, uh, way. 
And then the second point is that uh, very often it is difficult to communicate because there is an investment uh, in uh, young uh, uh, generations uh, and uh, it is difficult to communicate uh, these investments. Uh, uh, public spending uh, is not uh, concentrated on young uh, people, so there is a political resistance uh, to these projects, uh, to these uh, interventions. I'd like to know from you, is it then easy to apply these theories in practice? Well, uh, let me take your second point first. Obviously, there's a political reality anywhere. I was just in the, uh, with the uh, domestic policy group in uh, Washington last week in, in the White House group, and there are real, even though this new administration in Washington has had a very profound interest in these topics, there are political and budgetary realities everywhere, not just in Italy. But I would say that if we prioritize expenditure, this is something that's kind of gone out of style in economics, but it's unfortunate. It would have helped us a lot last uh, spring or last winter when we were starting to build a stimulus package. That when you start doing rates of return and start understanding which programs have high benefits and which ones don't, I would argue that everything we know about early childhood programs, at least what I know, has suggested extremely high rates of return. Not, not phenomenal, not 100% not rate of returns. But on a pure competition for budget items, it will win. So given a fair trade, when you ask, for example, Peter Orzag, who's now head of OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, when he was head of the uh, CBO and was doing studies, did a rate of return analysis on fixing potholes, holes on the streets. And uh, I can assure you, the rate of return on fixing potholes is much below the rate of return on fixing kids and uh, fixing disadvantaged uh, children. And I would say that a lot of the rate of return on infrastructure that's received so much attention has actually got a lower rate of return. I mean, there's some return. I'm not going to argue that one focuses all of the budget on one item. Of course not. That would be insane. But I do think that this does compete if you actually give it a fair chance to understand sort of how effective this is relative to a, to a lot of the other interventions even the standard interventions in education programs like reducing tuition. Or, as I said, that to me a, a staggering finding is that the minority-majority gap in college going is reversed. Black children are more likely to go to college than white children in the U.S. once you control for those ability factors at 16 and 17. Tuition plays a very minor role in explaining the difference. It's the ability to actually benefit from the college that's playing a big role. And when we understand that those ability factors can be supplemented, then a powerful lever is available for social policy. So I think it does challenge our thinking because we have to go outside the standard channels and, 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 and ask that we think more comprehensively about how skills are produced. In Italy and in the United States and in most countries, we think of different aspects of the life cycle as different cabinets, different functions. So we don't realize that if you want to reduce crime and you want to reduce uh, illness, that you start back with a certain set of social, emotional, and cognitive skills relatively early in life that essentially avoid a lot of the burden that is created if these skills aren't fostered early on. So you need to think much more creatively. So that, that's, that would be the pitch. But I realize that requires a lot of, a lot of further education of the public. Now, speaking about Tremblay, of course, Richard and I are together. We collaborate on projects. I have a very high regard. I knew that he was working in Italy. I did not know until now that he was working here, so that's great. He's a first-rate person. I would say that you're perfectly correct, that there is no determinism here. What you're doing is you're shaping people's ability to respond dynamically. So it's not like I can suddenly enroll kids and I get a homogeneous response or that there would be one uniform reaction. But what we can do is we now know ways to encourage children to enlarge their lives. And in that way, we can reduce a whole series of problems that are previously thought to be unrelated. So it, although I, I think Richard himself can be a little too deterministic at times in his work with Daniel Nagin, but nonetheless, I do think that this is one of many forces, but a powerful one that has not been addressed, namely supplementing the early lives of children. And, uh, seeing what the consequences would be. 
although I didn't mention it, uh, reduced crime is a huge activity. I showed you one figure, but in the cost-benefit studies of early childhood programs, one of the major determinants has been, the, one of the major benefits has been the lower rate of return on uh, the lower, lower crime rate among people who participate. Why? Because they're socially engaged, they have stronger measures of self-control, they're more motivated to participate in the larger society. And so I think that we see a broader notion of social policy if we, if we understand that, that we are talking about creating people. We are talking about creating people and giving them the empowerment to choose much richer lifestyles so they can see possibilities for themselves they didn't see before. They can break out of their identities that social class or other restrictions may have placed on them and so they can actually enlarge their capability sets. So in that sense, I honestly believe that uh, it is a different approach than what we've followed and that once you follow through the logic, in the United States, it's now becoming very much accepted. Five years ago, it wasn't uh, to the extent it is now. But as the evidence has piled up, and there's always room for overstatement, there's always a lot of hyperbole. But what we've observed is that increasingly, groups from across the political spectrum are supporting these ideas of early investments. Why? Because they are essentially creating the capabilities that people of all uh, backgrounds, I think, value. And I think this is a huge uh, a change, and I think it just requires a little bit of education. And uh, I'm sure that uh, plenty of people are here to, to, to provide that education. So. And the message was very clear. Grazie mille, davvero. Grazie.